Hi, welcome to Culture Determined on Blogging Heads. I'm your host, Arya Cohen-Wade, and my guest today is Seth Simons. Seth, could you please introduce yourself? I'm Seth Simons. Uh, I'm a freelance journalist covering labor and equality and extremism in comedy, uh, mostly via my newsletter, uh, Humorism, which can be found at humorism.xyz. It's not a substandard newsletter, but uh, just a, a normal newsletter. So thank you for coming on today. And we're going to be talking about a piece that you wrote a couple weeks ago for the Substack, uh, which will be linked to below, a long post about SNL. But why don't, you, why don't we talk just a little bit more about humorism and the project? And you gave you know, your one-line summary of it, which I think is also on, uh, attached to the, the website. But mm-hmm. you can go a little deeper into... Uh, the unique angle that you're taking on reporting on the world of comedy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been doing this for about, I want to say six or seven years. Um, and I say six or seven because I forget how much time has passed over the last year itself, thanks to the pandemic. Um, but uh, I write about the comedy industry with a focus on what it's like to work in the comedy industry, sort of at the ground floor and rungs above it, um, comedy theaters comedy clubs um, that form this pipeline that feeds TV shows like SNL, um, which I've done a fair bit of writing about. Um, uh, sort of, I started the newsletter um, at the end of 2018 just to cover layoffs and other turmoil at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater. Uh, once, you know, the leading improv theater now doesn't really exist except as an online school. Um, and then I sort of started focusing on the newsletter in earnest, uh, pretty much at the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, my focus over the last year has been, um, you know, the political economy of comedy clubs, which are run as all these weird little sort of right-wing fiefdoms um, around the country. Um, The way comedy as an industry just sort of persisted during the pandemic, indoor shows never really let up. Um, I write about, um, uh, well, we're here to talk about SNL, and I've been writing about SNL sort of, uh, sort of from a left-wing critique perspective um, for a, a few years, um, just looking at the way the show functions to flatter the powerful, um, the way it's run as, I would argue, sort of little dictatorship of, by Lauren Michaels um, and uh, the sort of its broader influence on the culture, which I think is weirdly underappreciated in ways we can get into later. Yeah, and I, I found uh, your your piece really interesting in that i mean i guess you know before we started recording we say we're not going to mention dave Chappelle, but um the it seems like sort of the only way the comedy world is sort of covered these days in the popular in popular media is either like straightforward you know the same sort of thing that would have been reported 20 years ago or the cancel culture angle of mm-hmm. comedians saying or doing something offend some group and then people get mad and that's you know that has played out with mm-hmm. um with the Chappelle stuff which um we're not going to talk about but so this is a, a different perspective mm-hmm. and uh, a valuable one i think and uh so w- would it be is it like a left labor perspective would that be an accurate term of looking at i, I think so yeah um i mean with snl specifically i um i mean i think the i really started getting into it in like 2017 when um I think the first really critical thing I wrote about SNL was when they fired, not fired, they suspended one of their writers for making a tweet about Baron, a joke about Baron Trump on Twitter that, you know, got the right wing media riled up and um, they suspended her for crossing the line and offending um, Baron, Baron of all people. Um, and uh, that sort of just clued me into the way, um, like Weekend Update, which has been, which is sort of the show's political voice. Um, and that has been run by Colin Jost and Michael Che for the last era, um, just functions as this weirdly, I think, conservative voice that, you know, back in 2016 and 2017 was, you know, actively critiquing identity politics and blaming Trump's victory on them. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, SNL may, does get headlines occasionally for, you know, the cancel culture stuff um, when it, uh, people... The, for like the thing I just mentioned, um, but I, I don't think it's really appreciated as just for the last 50 years being 
the thing it is just now, um, I think, getting, you know, really the attention for, um, which is it's just been this steady conservative voice that exists to uh, uh, make big corporations money um, and to, you know, praise and flatter the people who host it or, you know, actors, politicians, what have you. Mm-hmm. So someone who is uh, in the audience for this program, who just heard you say SNL is a conservative institution, um, might be surprised at that because, well, they spent four years paying Alec Baldwin to put on orange makeup and make fun of Trump. And uh, they didn't go easy on Trump, I would say. And I, I and I should say I haven't, you know, I have not been a regular SNL viewer for probably about two decades. Um, and probably like most people now consume it via social media or embedded clips on Vulture or something like that the day after. And we can talk about you talk about that in your essay a little bit. So we should hold on to that for later. But um, why? Uh, so so uh, convince the, the skeptical conservative in the audience who says, what are you talking about? This is a bunch of a feat. Uh, New York liberals making fun of, you know, uh, Donald Trump and uh, Sarah Palin and so forth. Well, I mean, it's sort of hack at this point to say that you know in America we have what, what is it, the center right party and the, the center left party, or just a, a center right and a centrist party. Um, and you know, the the Dems for a while have you know tacked conservative. And I think sort of the notion um, or the image of liberalism that uh, SNL celebrates. Um, is mostly just that image of uh, uh, they really embrace sort of the resistance idea over the Trump years, which I, I assume I probably don't have to explain to your audience why the resistance sucked. Um, and uh, it's it sort of, and again, I don't watch it regularly. I do also mostly consume it through clips and through the occasional full episode. Um, but uh, I would argue that the sort of notion of liberalism celebrated on SNL is mostly performative um, and just to score points with liberals um who get their politics by watching you know the daily show and msnbc um but i would also uh say that there, there are two ways of talking about snl and comedy generally i think and the popular one is just to talk about it in sort of aesthetic terms um and you know the as you know whether jokes are funny or not whether jokes are well written or not um and then there's you know you can sort of talk about how uh snl um is run by, has been run mostly by the same guy for its entire existence, um, who has, you know, very explicitly said, uh, you know, he he told his cast members he didn't want them to go too hard on Donald Trump because uh, he knew Trump from the talk show circuit. Um, He didn't want them to uh, go hard on Weinstein when all the Weinstein stuff came out because, you know, it's just a New York thing, he said. Um, I think uh, Lauren Michaels embodies the sort of that like echelon um, of society where you know the liberals and the conservatives do become indistinguishable because um, they don't live in the same world as everyone else really and their interests are pretty aligned um, and uh, I've argued this in a separate essay about Colin Jost's um, memoir a year ago where uh, what, what, what Colin Jost's stories who's he's uh, been the head writer for a long time as I said, the host of Weekend Update, his story sort of shows to me how the way that you are successful at SNL and you stay inside the system for years and rise up through its ranks is by doing what Lauren says and making him happy. Um, and what makes him happy is when all of his rich and famous friends are happy. Um, a bunch of you know uh, alums of the show have said that you know Lauren just uh, wants to be surrounded by famous people. He wants to be liked by famous people. Um, there are former cast members have said, you know, he had trouble getting them to pay attention to what they want because he uh, was too busy focused on, you know, his much more famous um, uh, alumni of the show. Um, Taryn Killam, in like, I believe the same interview where he said that uh, Trump told them, to, I mean, Lauren told them to go easy on Donald Trump, said that. Uh, would, would this have been before, yeah. the ele- before the 2016 election he said this? Yeah, for it was like a. May I forget when exactly the episode was? Because he because he hosted right because Trump hosted. Yeah. 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 In um, twenty in twenty fifteen, I guess that would have been. Yeah, and it's haunting to, to watch that episode. Um, but uh, in the same podcast where Taron Killam described you now that edict, um, 
we talked about how at the 40th anniversary special, um, when all of these, all of these, you know, alumni who are all now hugely famous TV stars, movie stars, producers, um, directors came back to celebrate the show, um, that, uh, you could see that go to Michael's head and, um, that according to, you know, some alumni is when it sort of stopped being a collaboration between Lauren and the head writers and just became, you know, Lauren telling the head writers what to do. Um, and, uh, we could, I could talk about this forever, but um, there's sort of a culture that you see described um, by former cast members of uh, walking on eggshells around the man, of um, not wanting to make him unhappy. If you make him unhappy, he will fire you. He won't invite you or hire you back. Um, Colin Jarrett describes having panic attacks outside Lauren's office, um, waiting to just discuss sketches with him. Um, it's just this weirdly toxic institution that for some reason has, uh, it, you know, it's a kingmaker. It decides who gets to be rich and famous for the rest of their lives. It has enormous power. Um, I believe the question, I've gotten a bit away from the question, but uh, when I describe it as conservative, I mean, it is this like fiefdom run by a conservative, rich old man. Right. Okay. So Lord Michaels is 76. Uh, he He still is as much in charge as he ever was. And is that, I mean, he, he's not going to be around forever. Is he, is he, do we have any idea what is he waiting for 50 and then he'll retire or he, I mean, he could obviously drop it at any point. Yeah. Um, but, and, and also like if, if, if it, it is the, is your critique that, well, Lauren is bad. And if we get someone less bad in there, it'll be less bad or that the system <laughs> that the show has built itself and built around itself, and the fact that it's owned by um, NBC, which is owned by whoever multinational corporation, and yeah. all of its sponsors are big companies, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, is this such that if Lauren dropped dead tomorrow and they put in Sarah Sherman to, to run the th- run the thing instead, and we'll talk about who she is yeah. if people don't know shortly. Um, you know, w- w- would sort of the same thing happen yeah. or? Uh, moving backwards to those questions, um, I do think um, the system is bad. I think, um, and I talk about this, I believe, in the post that is at, at issue here. Um, but uh, the, the show, again, as, as um, sorry, I'm collecting my thoughts. Um, the show exists to sell ads. The reason, you know, Lauren Michaels can do whatever he really wants to do there is because it makes a lot of money and has, um, you know, made a lot of money for NBC in the last couple of years. Um, and there is sort of a, a deference to the advertiser, um, who, like has sensor power over the sketches, which, you know, not unheard of in television, but um, goes against arguments of, that it does good or edgy comedy. Um, uh, and uh, I think, you know, the, the influence of the advertiser warps the mind of the comedian who comes up to that institution. Um, Going back to Colin Jost, uh, he talks in his memoir, memoir about um, how they, they couldn't tell jokes about Nazis or Hitler because Volkswagen didn't want the audiences to be reminded of Volkswagen's origin uh, in you know, Nazi Germany. Um, and uh, Colin Jost thought this was funny and silly, but you know, went along with it anyways. Um, and then the Volkswagen emissions scandal came out. Um, that was when Volkswagen was lying about, you know, how bad their emissions were. So he and his you know, co-writers wrote a digital short uh, lampooning Volkswagen's origins in Nazi Germany that uh, was all recorded, produced, edited, ready to go. Um, and then they had to ax it at the last minute because NBC was about to close another huge deal with Volkswagen. Um, so, you know, even the, you can't, in that environment, I think, meaningfully speak truth to power uh, except, you know, in the superficial sense of having Alec Baldwin go up there and pucker his lips and, um, you know, look like Donald Trump and kiss Putin, uh, kiss Ben Putin. Um, and Putin. Uh, and so I do sort of think were you to just, you know, get rid of the current rich old man who's good at running that system, the next person would be subject to the same, um, you know, the same incentives um, and need to serve the same masters above um, the show itself. Um, I mean, I, I don't know how much longer he'll be there. I know he definitely does want to go to at least 
50. Um, you know, there were a bunch of stories over the summer about how he was pressuring cast members to stay um, a couple more years until their 50th anniversary. And, you know, is rumored to have really liked the 40th anniversary celebration. So it would make sense to want to keep going to that bigger benchmark. <laughs> and, um, and what are, what year are we at now? I think we're at 47. Um, okay. I do or, remember the thir- I remember the 30th. So when w- that would have been in the late 90s. Yeah, I think 40 was 2015. Yeah. Um, maybe 2014, 2015 season. Okay. I forget exactly. Um, okay. So, okay. So in some ways, the, you know, ego of an elderly white man is being flattered um, and everything else is circling around that. And that sort of, in its Vegas outline, sounds like the Trump White House, um, except I guess Laura Michaels is a more competent administrator than Donald Trump was and really does rule the roost and get his will inf- enforced. Um, okay, so, well, let's let's move on to the uh, the sort of a pers- <laughs> event that sparked your post, which was uh, they announced their new hires, you know, six or so weeks ago, and um, and two of them were, and so I think this is, you know, as someone who sort of pays attention to comedy, but not closely, I think this was the first time I ever, at least that I can remember, knew who some of the people were who were hired from SNL because, you know, it's it's usually semi-unknowns that they pluck from, you know, Second City or UCB or touring stand-ups or something. Um, but I knew, two, I knew two of the three, and one is, well, you can t- t- tell us more about yeah. who these people are, but... Um. Well, we got, yeah, uh, so James one Austin, one is Sarah Sherman, Johnson. who also goes by Sarah Squirm, and one is this guy. Um, oh, sorry, his name just popped up in my head. James Johnson. Austin Johnson. Yes, who went viral late last year because he did like the best Trump inter- uh, Trump impersonation that I was familiar with, and but somehow it only went viral like October of of last year, and then and now they hired him and he's he's doing Biden um, for them. So yeah, so I mean. One thing about this word about SNL is it's mostly just a show of celebrity impressions. Um, and so if you are good at doing celebrity impressions like Daryl Hammond or something, then that, you know, you found your perfect, um, you know, media or whatever. And so uh, Johnson, who has this pitch perfect Trump impression, you know, if they had found him a couple of years ago, maybe he would have been doing it instead of Alec Baldwin, although it's interesting, you know, think about Baldwin's role and all this is, Interesting, the fact that it was not actually a good impression um, is part of it. But yeah, and now they have him doing Biden. He does a serviceable Biden. But then Sarah Squirm, a.k.a. Sarah Sherman, is a much more unusual comedian. And then there's a third guy who I can't remember his name, who was also hired. Aristotle and, something. Yes. And um, OK, so what did you what did you think? And so you're, the piece that we're discussing, you framed it as a um, sort of a Q&A with yourself. but. Um, you launch off with saying like, should we, should we be happy? Should fans of like alt comedy or funny people who work their way up through Twitter or something? Um, yeah. Should they be happy that two, two such people landed at SNL? Right. I mean, both uh, James and Sarah are, I think it's safe to say the sort of comics you don't usually see on SNL. Sarah is someone who you might describe as more of an adult swim comic. Um, and James is, you know, an internet uh, star and impressionist who I guess is sort of, the type you might be more lately expect to see um, as SNL has been plucking from internet sketch groups. Um, but uh, uh, Sarah um, is you know, also someone who has auditioned for the show before and hasn't gotten on it and has sort of made a mark for herself um, doing sort of gross out body horror, really out there, um, high concept humor that, uh, that, you know, it's not the sort of thing that succeeds on network television. Um, very often and she's also a socialist and um uh one of the last live comedy shows i saw before the pandemic was i believe on the day of the california primary and she was in it and um just sort of interrogated this woman in the front row about whether she had voted for liz or bernie and the woman just well she was wouldn't say so she was just meeting something in the front row and kept coming up with you know uh increasingly elaborate excuses not to answer the question um very fun um i uh, i love sarah uh I would both of them. Um, I would say they're two of the you know funnier and more naturally talented people coming up today. Um, I think also you know that they represent the ways that comedians can find audiences outside of um, traditional avenues like SNL, um, which 
you know, audiences obviously don't always correlate to um, a good income or a living, um, but, uh, you know, they show the way that um, SNL, is, the SNL is not as relevant as it used to be for, um, you know, the young comedian trying to make it. Um, and they both just got, you know, uh, featured player jobs um, on the show that uh, I sort of feel like uh, as each year passes, it's harder and harder to argue as a good force in comedy and in the world. So I think as each year has passed since, you know, since Trump took office, um, the show just increasingly veered into um, serving resistance libs um, and uh, was going for lower and lower apples. Um, I think it's become harder to argue that it is a good force in the world and in comedy. And I think it's especially hard to make that argument this year, um, given the thing that happened in August when a uh, Jane Doe filed a child sex abuse lawsuit against SNL, arguing that in the early aughts, um, she then, uh, the administrator of the uh, Horatio Sands and Jimmy Fallon fan forum, um, went to SNL cast parties um, and was groomed there and online by Horatio Sands, um, a D-list TV star, um, but in full view of uh, cast members like Jimmy Fallon, who also emailed her and led her into a cast party and chatted with her about her SATs while she was drinking a beer um, at a cast party, allegedly, um, and in full view of Lauren Michaels um, and other cast members at um, like a after party at another cast member's loft where Horatio Sands allegedly um, digitally penetrated her, according to the lawsuit. Um, and I, uh, it, it, it made, this lawsuit made headlines when it came out that mostly focused on Horatio Sands and less on the systemic um, sort of enabling of abuse, um, which to me is uh, the bigger story um, that, uh, you know, a bunch of people allegedly watched this happen. Um, and then, you know, one of them, Jimmy Fallon, went on to host a major talk show um, with an audience of very young fans. Um, and, you know, SNL just did it sort of from there increasingly got more and more powerful. Lauren Michaels got more and more powerful. Um, and when I say power with regard to Lauren Michaels, I mean that uh, pretty much everyone who comes through SNL and then leaves and then goes and does other projects, his hand turned them. Um, his production company produces a lot of them. Um, he sort of has influence over them for the rest of their lives and obviously makes money from their projects. Um, and uh, it's not the sort of person you can really cross. Um, and I don't know what's going to happen with this lawsuit that um, the, the complaint mentions in detail the texts that Horatio Sands sent to the plaintiff apologizing for what he did years ago and saying stuff like, if you want to meet to me, I deserve it. Um, which I personally think is the sort of thing you wouldn't put in the complaint uh, if you didn't have evidence to back it up. Um, but uh, we'll see what happens with that. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, it was all no comments from SNL and NBC and Lauren Michaels, um, and it sort of just immediately faded into the background. And I think that's the sort of thing that people should have to answer questions about. I think it's, you know, a set of very serious allegations about people who are in power right now. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, to, to go and work for the person uh, alleged to have facilitated that sort of abuse is to just go and say, I will, you know, you can, I can never for the rest of my life talk about it or question that person. Um, and I increasingly think it's not a good deal um, for comedians to take to, uh, you know, close the door to uh, being able to actually speak truth to, to actual powers in the world. Um, I think I've gotten a bit away from the question again. Um, but sort of the thrust of the essay we're talking about is that uh, it weighs the pros and cons of, you know, left-leaning comedians taking uh, a job in the machine, pretty much the epitome of, of, you know, the corporate machine that exists in comedy. Um, and there are obvious pros, which the one I just mentioned, you know, you, you succeed in SNL, you can do whatever you want for the rest of your life. You can work forever. You can go and make those weird, uh, projects, those, you know, leftist projects, you can give money to all of your friends who would otherwise uh, probably be able to work in comedy because they're just as weird as you are. Um, but you also uh, are going to be captive to this system for the rest of your life. And I mean, there are lots of examples, I think, of people um, 
going from being, I think, original, thoughtful, new voices to establishment figures. Um, uh, you could look at Tina Fey's career over the last decade or so um, and see that happen with her. Um, and uh, I, I, I tend to lean towards thinking it's not a good deal to take. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there's a lot there, and that's you, the way you laid it out is very interesting. So, um, yeah, so the the story of the lawsuit, um, if I didn't pay half, you know, keep half an eye on what was happening in the comedy world, I don't think I would have even heard about this. I, I doubt the average person who watches SNL has even heard of this story. It hasn't gotten that much press, and I'm not quite sure why that is. I guess there's possible more benign and more nefarious explanations. One is that Horatio Stance is not really a star anymore, and he's the central person implicated, but of course, Jimmy Fallon is a giant star. And, um, so if he was complicit in some way in this, um, then that would be a big scandal. And so, um, you know, uh, after, um, you know, after the, uh, the B2 era has started, it would seem like this would attract more attention. It hasn't. So if you have any thoughts on that, that would be welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I I think it's, it is those things. Um, it's, uh, it's centered on the ratio and it's hard to, you know, make a story land if it's not about someone famous. Um, and I don't, I, I don't know if it was intentional, uh, the first time around to, you know, center him coverage or if a bunch of, you know, websites just saw the other headlines that had not, you know, fully described the breadth of the case and just aggregated based on aggregations. I don't know. Um, but I also think it's, um, uh, if I had just escaped me, um, well, or, or is there just the same sort of thing of like, these are, this is a, a very powerful institution and you know is is nbc of course nbc you know did report on allegations against matt lauer um, right. but maybe sort of that was a couple of years ago and things are more heady back then and now yeah. they're more eager to, sl- I remember wipe, to sort of sweep something like this mm-hmm. under the rug yeah well i think it's easier to justify not covering um cases where there's one accuser um or one victim um you know the you see this with lots of other Me Too stories is that usually the ones that make a dent are the ones with a pattern of uh, offenses. Um, and I, I don't think it's good, well, good that that is the standard, but I think that is the standard um, that these things rarely pick up steam um, if, uh, if there's only one person. Um, and I think also given Lauren's status, uh, a lot of, say, the voices that would plug other stories about alleged abuses against comedians or other people in entertainment aren't going to tweet or make a fuss about this one. Um, and then I do think also NBC, uh, as I said, sort of in, in the article I wrote, um, makes a lot of entertainment that, you know, is the bread and butter of a lot of entertainment publications um, that are dependent on access to it um, and or it may directly have a stake in them. I'll say without saying what exa- what it was, um, that I, I was asked to talk about the lawsuit on a publications podcast a couple of weeks ago, and then they canceled it because their lawyers could not clear the subject. Um, and would you believe NBC owns several hundred million dollars um, of that publication? Okay, um, that's interesting. Well, which, you can say whatever you want here because yeah. Uh, yeah. no, no, we're not mm-hmm. we're not um, you know su- suing uh, culturally determined would would not be uh, profitable for anyone, yeah. but. Um, but yeah, obviously these are all allegations, um, and uh, and, and I guess because it's she, so she, the uh, Jane Doe is suing like SNL or the production company that runs SNL, saying that they like she's suing Horatio Sands, SNL, NBC, and a bunch of you know John Doe um, defendants who will be uncovered theoretically through discovery um, as you know the people who are in charge who let this go on. I think it's not inconceivable that. Lauren Michaels would become a defendant. Um, that uh, all the current producers there, who a lot of several of them have been there for decades, um, would end up being defendants. I don't think we would get that far. I think it would probably settle, um, given the you know amount of people implicated. Um, it would be a bombshell after bombshell if that went to trial. Um, right. But, uh, and if there was a settlement, it would probably involve like not just agreements or something to yeah. decide it, and then it's possible mm-hmm. that whatever actually did happen wouldn't come out for a long time yeah. or ever um mm-hmm. okay so that so that ha- that cloud is hanging over snl um yeah there's another one another cloud i forgot to mention um which is that 
the show just did indoor indoor shows last year during the pandemic um, that they sort of exploited a loophole in New York's um, you know COVID rules that I don't know if it's really a loophole or just flagrant violation where they paid audience members to be there and therefore were able to classify them as employees of the show. Um, and uh, just, you know, before there was a vaccine, while the thing was still raging in New York City, brought a bunch of 100 or so audience members into a room to record what I would argue is not essential. Um, but uh, Lauren, he said this in an interview with Vulture, um, before the season began, you really, you got to have the live laughter, you have to have the live element, or else you don't know that it's funny. Um, and there's no other way to do it. And I think that is absolutely crazy. And I think it is crazy that that was immediately normalized and accepted by the press um, that covers SNL. I think it is unconscionable. Um, I have heard about, you know, cases, COVID, positive COVID tests um, in the crew as of week one of the show. Um, they had an indoor cast party at a comedy club after Dave Chappelle's episode, who we're not going to talk about. Um, <laughs> but, you know, an indoor all night after party um, in a, you, you've been to comedy clubs, you know that they are not the most expansive spaces. Um, and uh, so just sort of it, it, right off the bat, the like attitude towards the pandemic was, well, we matter more than, you know, all this other stuff. So we got the comedy show has to go on. Um, and I think that is a huge cloud that should still be hanging over the show the same way it should hang over the entire comedy industry that, you know, so many comics can be performing indoors during it in unmasked up to unmasked audiences in small rooms, but uh, it has made no dent. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's sort of what I'm talking about when I say, you know, it's run by one guy who's sort of the, the like twilight zone kid who can make stuff happen with his mind. So everyone in the entire town is scared of him and does what he wants. I think that is, you know, what SNL is. Um, okay. And that, that metaphor I heard applied multiple times to Donald Trump. So that's another uh, another power yeah. that, of that famous Power Zone episode of the mm-hmm. all powerful child who is everyone must be satisfied because he can like turn you into a, um, uh, you know, Jack, a, Jack the box. box or something yeah. or send you out to the corn or whatever, yeah. whatever it was. Um, yeah. So um, so the uh, parallels between Lord Michaels and Donald J. Trump. Um, and OK, so. I mean, so something that is and I. The last time I talked about SNL on this show was um, an episode with a writer named Millie Macker. It was what sort of when cu- cancel culture was more in the news and people were like, is cancel culture real? Is cancel culture not real? And the um, and it was right when this they hired it was fall 2019. They hired some people. One of them was this guy who had told some racist jokes on podcasts or something and then he was you know his employment was withdrawn even before the season started yeah i i posted the video that started that uh, okay well that discourse right and um yeah i i I knew that but i forgot that but okay so so you uh helped uh in the you know the scourge of cancel culture that has taken over our lives you you played a key role in denying this poor innocent white man a job in snl but anyway um one thing we talked about then was how strange it is that SNL, um, the SNL is a cultural phenomenon and cultural powerhouse that continues to like find some of the most talented people in the country and turn them turn mo- many of them into huge stars who yeah can sort of write their own ticket after they leave the show, but the show itself basically sucks and everyone sort of knows it sucks and it sucked for a long time and it seems like it was. The, the the like halcyon days of SNL are sort of when you are a, like t- teenager or preteen, because then you're like staying. It's like you're staying up late for the first time and watching something that's a little grown up. And so I remember it, you know, basically early mid nineties as being sort of a heyday. But it's like so it's it really is sort of written for teenagers. And yet yeah, a lot of it is just celebrity impersonations, which you know uh, um, James Austin Johnson does this incredible impersonation of Trump, but that is sort of like a limited form of comedy um, of just imitating a famous person. And it's often, you know, uh, the, the skits just are often crap. And even, despite the fact that it gets aggregated everywhere, they're like, maybe there's one or two funny skits, sketches, which one do they prefer calling it? Sketch or skit? Sketches in each episode. And, but most people sort of agree that like it's mediocre at best most of the time and yet it persists and yet it, it continues to be this colossus 
and it's and we're talking about it. Um, you know, it's been on the air for 47 years. Like this is all very strange. So obviously they they get super talented performers. I don't know whether the they get a lot of writers who are sort of like I don't know, the same sort of people who would work at The Simpsons or on late night shows. And I guess those are uh, maybe this is less than so they used to be, but often it's just like people who work for the Harvard Lampoon something in college, as, as Colin Jost did. But they're often, I don't know, they, they're maybe not as talented as the performers they get, but they, you know, they, they are an assembled super team of creators. And yet they they're sticking with this format that is so that they've had since the beginning seems sort of crazy. It's it, it's almost is crazy that they even managed to do it week in and week out because it's they're like on a high wire and they are like working nonstop. And so just the fact that they put up like literally put on a show every week is remarkable in some sense. But then like it shouldn't be surprising that like it's often crap because they're like, you know, they have this insane like rules that they set for themselves that it has to be live and it, 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 it half the skits have to comment on her events and it, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know what, so what do you, stepping back just a little bit, what do you make of it as this cultural phenomenon that? Yeah, I think it's a very strange phenomenon for all of the reasons you just said. And lately, I just sort of paralyzing to think about how everyone seems to know it's bad, but we all, it, it still gets so much attention, um, even so much good press um, and maintains such power. Um, I think the reason it is bad. Um, I think it all goes back to there is a weird old guy who has been in charge of it for 50 years. Um, and he is not really connected to the real world. Um, he, I think, probably has very outdated views about what's funny and or doesn't know what's funny. Um, but uh, the ultimate decisions about what sketches make it in the show lie with him. And his immediate underlings know that it's not a good idea to make him unhappy. Um, and, you know, the sketches that they choose, the head writers, the supervisors, um, probably in some way those decisions take into account Lauren's tastes. I say probably, but they obviously do. Um, Joe Stiddy's book talks about how um, w one challenge of being the writing supervisor, which is what he was before he was head writer, one challenge is um, walking the tightrope tight rope of knowing when to advocate for younger writers on the show who may have more out there ideas that, uh, you know, Lauren might not like them at the read. Um, but, you know, Joe's can convince them to let them in the show anyways. Um, and if they don't do well in the show, then, you know, Lauren might get so mad at the writer that he doesn't bring them back next season. Um, so it's sort of the job of the people in charge of the writing process to uh, not let anything too weird get in there. Um, and of course, there are exceptions to all of this. I think there is often very funny stuff in the show, um, which is why I also generally not interested in talking about comedy purely in terms of whether it's funny or not. Um, but, it, you know, also in terms of um, whether it's a, a good place to work when it, you know, it's broader effects on the culture. Um, the other thing which you're getting at when you talk about how, um, like a lot of late night shows, um, the sort of writing pool is drawn from uh, a system that is naturally filtered to, um, you know, send, frankly, well-off people um, into late-night writers. Or send Col um, Colin Jost types. Yeah. Like, yeah. Colin Jost, I mean, he wrote, I mean, his his memoir, I didn't read it, but I read, I read Willie Staley's review of it uh, in Slate. And um, yeah, it, I mean, it's called like a, a very punchable face or something. Like he, he, he plays with the idea that he's like this obnoxious, preppy, you know, blandly handsome guy who happens to have married the most beautiful woman in the world and has the greatest job on earth, et cetera, et cetera. And but sort of like understands his mediocrity or or something. I don't know. But yeah. And he yeah. So he, you know, is like the child of doctors and, and went to Harvard and um and yeah, was editor of the Lampoon. And, and it's been and he's been there since he was 22. It's been his only real job, you know, other than a brief stint working for the Staten Island events. And um a Nickelodeon show, but sort of this is, this gets to bigger problems in comedy and the entertainment industry and you know media and journalism, which is um, you know the the pipeline uh, that feeds SNL and other late night shows is you know UCB, Second City, Groundlings, um, these sort of comedy schools that uh, to you know to succeed in them first have to be able to pay thousands of dollars to take classes to perform on house teams to do you know free labor for years and years. Um, 
And, uh, you know, it, it's not, doesn't only mean that only rich people succeed, but it, in aggregate um, means that sort of the majority of people who get through that system and who get to the other jobs are people who can afford to do a lot of no, unpaid labor or low paid labor for many, many years. Um, and, uh, you know, those are the voices that then get into the SNL writers' room, the Seth Meyers writers' room, the Jimmy Fallon writers' room, and, uh, you know, filter the political satire that the rest of the country sees. Um, and, you know, uh, that's, I would say, not a great system if you want, you know, a variety of voices um, from, you know, different class backgrounds, different, you know, racial backgrounds. Um, and then there is just the other thing where there's a lot of nepotism. Um, and, uh, you know, the Harvard Lampoon is a, has for many years been uh, a pipeline to writers' rooms. Um, and, uh, you know, and that, that shapes the stuff that gets made um, and the stuff that becomes the standard for comedy and satire. Um, and, you know, as rich people get richer, their comedy gets worse. Um, uh, I think Colin Jones and Michael Che have, I haven't done this, but uh, I would argue it's probably they've become more and more blinkered over the years of that show as they and you know everyone else becomes more and more detached from sort of the material realities that most people are living under um and you know that's why the comedy doesn't speak to most people um or to real life yeah and i mean the, the fact that snl is sort of like you know like uh, uh, america's time to laugh or something is like indicates that it's not gonna it, it has to be broad it's on a network even though it's on at eleven thirty 30 p.m but um you know how sharp and biting could it be i mean like of course like letterman was doing all sorts of very strange stuff in the 80s in particular and he did go after like the sort of the corporate aspect and had like wars with um with the network that i think were were both performative, but like he did have real fights with them and stuff. And um, so, but yeah, but yeah, it just like, but he, you know, he was on at, at 1230 to one and it was, so it was sort of more of a niche thing. And yeah, the fact that, <clears throat> yeah, it's just this, you know, beloved institution, like, you know, baseball and apple pie or something at this point. So it's not gonna do something really out there. Okay. But then they, so they hire uh, Sarah squirm who, um, is yeah is much stranger than the type of person they hired also doesn't do any celebrity impressions as far as i know um at least she didn't beforehand and yet the, the i've I, so i've heard on podcasts and stuff and seen follow on twitter and seen but i've never really delved into her but she does a lot of sort of gross out body humor that involves purposely um like fake looking like paper mache style stuff that she sticks to her body and like impels herself and like ooze and gunk and you know uh gross liquids come out of her fake body and, and all, all sorts of really out there stuff so yeah i guess it's it, adult swim more than um snl and so what is the fact that they hired her what does that imply about how the show sees itself or where it wants to go it tells me a couple things um i mean we know SNL hired Shane Gillis to try to appeal to a more, you know, red state audience. Um, I think they're going in the other direction now and trying to appeal to, you know, an audience that lives online, um, that watches its sketches, you know, on Twitter the next day um, or on Vulture or whatever. Um, I think that's another weird thing about SNL is that it's sort of is this bifurcated show where there are the sketches that exist to be watched by the live audience, um, you know, the cold open, um, stuff like that. And then there are the sketches that are clearly meant to go viral. Um, and, you know, find their audience on Twitter. Um, and I think SNL knows that. Um, and I think, you know, reaching, they're sort of reaching into the internet famous people um, like James Austin Johnson and Sarah Sporham, the sketch group, uh, Please Don't Destroy, who are in their writer's room and I think are sort of de facto cast members. Um, you know, they've made a couple of digital shorts already. These, these um, are like the three young guys who are going viral roughly a year ago. Yes, uh, both of whom have uh, family ties to the show. Um, Right. Sorry, two of which have family ties. Um, yes. And so, yeah, so I don't know if you spend time on Twitter, you probably saw these things because they would go viral. And it was it's like three guys who are 23 years old doing like, you know, 45 second long skits that were quite creative and often funny. But one of them is like the son of a former 
as a head writer or something. And um, one of them, yeah, um, one of them is the son of a current longtime writer producer, Steve Higgins, who's also uh, Jimmy Fallon's announcer. And another one is the son of a uh, longtime writer and Adam Sandler's co writer. Um, and uh, I mean, they're all they're very funny. Um, I like them. Um, I am weirded out that the show seems to you know have no problem with uh, nepotism. Um, uh, that PR that that could theoretically earn, but hasn't yet. Um, but uh, oh, but to get back to the question, um, I think SNL knows that you know the future of comedy is online. Um, is in is in sort of weirder um, than you know the networks and shit. Um, and you know they can see who's famous, and they want the good people. Um, in their in their team. Um, they don't want anyone else to have them. Um, so uh, I think there's, you know, a lot of strategic um, reasons uh, to hire someone like Sarah Squirm, even if Lauren Michaels is personally grossed out. <laughs> right. And so he's old enough to be her grandfather. Um, and but yeah, so it, it's strange to imagine them, imagine him who are caricaturing or perhaps describing accurately as sort of an out of, out of touch elderly man who gets his way all the time, seeing Sarah Squirm's gross out stuff. and. And you know, saying hire that woman. Um, so maybe we've underestimated him somewhat, or maybe it's just a, a, a much more cynical sort of thing of like, you know, get me what the kids like these days, and you know that they like, you know, a paper mache flayed human, you know, walk, walking around, which is was one of her um, Sarah's things from a couple of years ago. Um, so, okay, well, are there? So you mentioned UCB earlier, and I didn't realize that UCB is essentially defunct now. I, I knew that they like closed their theaters during COVID and decided not to reopen them. But that was sort of a, a different power center. And uh, and obviously, um, Amy Poehler went from UCB to SNL, but the, I don't think the other three guys did. And then they built this alternative system of, you know, of improv classes and stuff that produced uh, a lot of talented people or gave a lot of people a chance to do something. And um, if that is now defunct now, is, is like SNL even more just the only game in town or? Um, well, there's still Second City um, and Groundlings. Um, I mean, it's, I think it's sort of too soon to see what's going to happen uh, with, you know, that sort of level of the comedy industry because there was just a pandemic and uh, I don't uh, bunch of you know these companies got absolutely devastated financially which is not entirely the pandemic's fault it's in many cases their own fault um and we have yet to see how they'll actually recover um and i know there are you know new new clubs and venues forming um we'll see how they integrate with um the broader pipeline um but uh i don't know um i think uh well, I think the, the pipeline at the ground floor of the comedy industry has been fucked for a long time for you know, sort of the um, reasons I got into earlier um, with our, you know, an incredibly uh, unequal system um, that has just gotten more and more unequal over the years. Um, and, you know, like other parts of the entertainment industry, um, the whole thing is dependent on unpaid labor um, that is not sustainable. Um, and, you know, we're sort of seeing the ramifications of that in film right now, um, as you know, with the IOTC um, strike authorization, you know, the fight for fair work conditions for crew members. Um, I uh, don't know what we're going to see happen in comedy, um, where it's just sort of been building very slowly to the system where you have to be rich to succeed and to get, you know, the plum jobs. Um, and also, you know, you have to be willing to put up with all sorts of abuse um, and all sorts of, uh, you know, increasingly reactionary environments. Um, so I don't know to answer the question um, that I might have gotten away from anyways. Is, okay, uh, is there anything that has started during the pandemic that seems to have um, kept, kept on going in some way? Like, you know, like move, moving stuff up, you know, there were, there were people performing online or on rooftops or in public parks or something during the pandemic, or at least the early part. Is there anything that uh, gives you uh, some hope for for the future yeah. of 
of comedy? Um, I know of a few cooperative comedy theaters that have opened in the last couple months or are preparing to open. Um, I don't want to jinx it um, because I feel like if they fail, then everyone will be like, oh, well, co-ops don't work. Back to the capitalist mode. Um, but I'm curious to see how they do. Um, I know, you know, there are a lot of people who are fed up with the system um, and who want to find something more sustainable where people get compensated fairly for their work. Um, sort of, uh, I guess that's the main thing. It gives me hope. I don't have a tremendous amount of hope right now, but uh, uh, excited about that. Um, I'm I'll be curious to see what happens with Sarah and James on SNL. It is, I think, for all the judgment I've been doing too soon to see whether they will, you know, be able to flourish there. If Sarah will be able to do the kind of stuff that she's good at. Um, the, the the bigger problem that that is all I think cemented for me is, um, you know, what, what sucks about comedy is that to be successful in comedy, to be able to make the stuff you want to make. Um, for the rest of your life to make a, a living doing it, to feed a family, you basically have to sell out. You have no choice. Um, you have to be a late night writer um, or a sitcom writer um, and in some capacity sell your soul um, with exceptions. Um, I think, you know, you should be able to make a living as a comedian doing live work in small rooms um, that's weird and fucked up and only a few people see it. Um, and uh, I dream of a world where that is possible, um, where, you know, you, you don't have to go work for Lauren Michaels or Jimmy Fallon to be able to do your fucked up gross out. Um, and uh, I, I hope these new models that are starting to emerge piecemeal, piecemeal in various communities uh, find a way to make that possible. Um, I guess I don't think it's possible without, you know, big structural reforms. Um, to the way American life works uh, without, you know, free healthcare. Um, that, uh, I won't get into that, um, but uh, that's, there's, there's the policy side and there's, you know, the industry side. Um, and both have to happen, but um, I think the pandemic did make clear to a lot of people how fucked up the system is. Meanwhile, other people, you know, just continue embracing the fucked up system um, and will continue embracing it. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe this will be the last question it seemed like um you know uh podcasting the the fact that you need very little um startup capital to make a podcast and the fact that the distribution model is not reliant on a major media operation or um or getting um you know volkswagen and um you know, Altria, et cetera, and Nabisco uh, on your side and that that and also the Patreon podcast, plus the Patreon or Substack model of monthly um, subscriptions seems like it could open a, a door to something, yeah. something different where you don't have to sell, sell out or sell your soul or something. Is that happening or um, it's happening more for people who are functionally right wing radio hosts um, <laughs> who have become famous through that model and are making. So those famous stand up comedians like Dave Rubin and Steven Crowder, um, um, Tim Dillon, Andrew Schultz, who um, got a Netflix special that he opened by uh, uh, blaming China for the pandemic and saying Chinese people are a bunch of virus slingers. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think, I mean, it's the same thing that's happening on Substack with, you know, the, the, the reactionary chud authors, um, you know, stoking transphobia. Um, or what have you, um, that I think, you know, there's there's huge audiences for that, um, and they are not served by, you know, late night fare um, or sitcom fare. Um, so they find uh, these, you know, mini Rush Limbaugh's um, on Patreon or on YouTube. Um, these guys build huge audiences, and then they can leverage that into, you know, stand-up careers, um, and they're all touring the country right now and playing sold out theaters and clubs and so that they sort of I think then come to dominate um that environment which is already fairly right um and that concerns me because I you know I think right wing men's fester um in there and uh gain power um and I uh, again with exceptions I don't see much of a left counterpoint to that obviously there are you know big left podcasters um and youtubers um but uh, 
the they have not transitioned from the podcasts to then the comedy clubs and theaters um, in the same way that people like Tim Dillon um, or Andrew Schultz have, or Joe Rogan, um, who uh, is now going to open his own comedy club in Austin, Texas, because he doesn't uh, think the industry is uh, hospitable towards his viewpoints or the viewpoints that he wants to um, cultivate. Um, so, again, remains to be seen um, what happens there. Yes. Right. And this is a thought that has just come to me, and maybe it doesn't make any sense, or maybe it's other people have made already, but there is something sort of inherently reactionary friendly in the stand up comedy model where you have someone alone on stage, you know, barking and forcing a physical reaction out of other people. And perhaps that's why the types of people who you mentioned who are all conservative white men are able to flourish within this. And then, you know, possibly you could think like, you know, improv sketch is more suited toward a leftist um, sort of person or system or something because it's uh, more cooperative or something. Yeah. Is this, um, is this I, I've, written about, sensible I've written a lot about this too. I do think clubs um, tend to be more reactionary, conservative to reactionary environments. And they've sort of been curated to be that over many decades. Um, I mean, sort of the, the, the thing that is standard in comedy is, you know, is free speech. These are all spaces for free speech. Um, and what free speech means to comedians is that they can say slurs um, and, uh, you know, uh, make ruthlessly racist and fan sort of jokes. And uh, you can't complain about it because um, free speech. If you don't like it, don't watch it. And that's sort of just been the standard for the entire time that the industry has existed. And the, the effect of that, uh, you know, over the decades has been that this, the people who come to comedy clubs are by and large people who want to see that. Um, and uh, it's, you know, very rare that, you know, a comic will be, uh, you know, telling racist jokes and someone will get up and say, that's racist, I'm leaving. Um, and when it does happen, they're the, you know, exception to the rule. The club owner says, well, most of the people like this, um, so it must not have been racist. Um, I mean, I've talked to club owners who've said that. I've read books where, um, I mean, there's a book out about the comedy seller earlier this year. Um, it's called Don't Applaud, uh, Either Laugh or Don't. Um, it's sort of an oral history of the space, you know, and there's a bit um, where uh, the owner of the cellar, you know, he just straight up says, you know, there have been comics who work for him who have said vile, horrible, anti-Semitic shit. Um, but he's not going to stop booking them. He considers that their business. Um, and, you know, you see that multiplied across every axis. Um, and uh, uh, so, yeah, I think it is very easy to be uh, successful and build an audience as a comedian, you know, catering specifically to sort of right wing or white groups. Um, the spaces already exist. Um, I think the thing that's going to increasingly happen, and you sort of saw this with the Shane Gillis stuff um, on SNL a couple of years ago, um, is, you know, he, he, the, pod, the stuff he said on this podcast, uh, multiple podcasts, um, in which he was sort of known for saying, um, caused an uproar, uh, and a lot of people got upset about it, and you would see comedians coming in to defend him, saying, this is just comedy. Uh, this is just comedy. You, know, you can't question it. Um, it's just jokes. Um, and that happens again and again when a comedian makes headlines for saying just sort of overtly racist stuff, or overtly transphobic stuff, is um, the other comics circle the wagons. There's very, there's not really a culture of mutual accountability um, or the uh, yeah, um, you know, the, it, it becomes sort of a badge of honor to uh, push through that um, rather than consider that perhaps it's good to stop doing hack racist jokes. Um, so I think we're going to see sort of that get worse and worse as these Patreon people get more and more famous and as, you know, um, Rogan and Chappelle, who we're not going to talk about, open up their own clubs and start you know, curating the next generation themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're ending on a dark note. Um, but, um, but perhaps appropriate given, uh, everything we discussed in this episode. Um, anything else you want to add? We've gone, we've gone about an hour. Um, um, I think we've covered, um, all the readers digest of the depressing stuff in comedy right now. <laughs> um, okay. So the, the newsletter is humorism. Humorism.xyz is is the website. You are also and where where else can people find your work? Um, you are on Twitter. 
I'm on Twitter at SA Simons. I'm sort of on a Twitter hiatus, you know, trying to cleanse the brain. Um, but uh, yeah, occasionally I'll freelance in other sites. Um, but you know, the newsletter is where I do most of my writing. Right. And it is, it is a subscription. It's not Substack, but it is a subscription. Yeah, it's called Letter Drop. Service. Um, I mean, it's mostly, it's mostly free. It's like sort of the NPR model where the subscription supports all of it but, um, for everyone. But, but I do occasionally put out paywall stuff. Um, it's usually more bloggy or gossipy. Okay, cool. Um, well, uh, thanks for coming on and talk and talking about this. Um, and the links to all the things will be below. You know, this is um, the Culture Term is now on its own YouTube channel, so you know you can smash that subscribe button. You can hit that thumbs up. You can share on social. You can tell your friends. You can do all sorts of things, um, and, or you can not do them. Um, but <laughs> I appreciate. Uh, people who do the, do those things are people who just watch and, you know, you can rate and review on iTunes and all that other stuff. But um, things we have, we have to do to satisfy the algorithms and the capitalist infrastructure that exploits our labor. But um, uh, so, but anyway, <laughs> thank you, Seth, for coming on. And thank you for uh, thanks to our viewers and listeners. And we'll see you again next time.